talk about one of the other giant issues hanging over all of this. Whenever somebody like Mark Zuckerberg goes in front of an institution like Congress, will Congress turn around and decide that this internet juggernaut needs to be regulated a lot more than it's regulated right now? Here's Lindsey Graham, Republican of South Carolina. What would you tell people in South Carolina that given all the things we've just discovered here, it's a good idea for us to rely upon you to regulate your own business practices? Well, Senator, my position is not that there should be no regulation. I think the Internet is increasingly a price regulation. I, I think the real question, as the Internet becomes more important in people's lives, is what is the right regulation, not whether there should but be or not. you as a company, would you work with us in terms of what regulations you think are necessary in your industry? Absolutely. Well, I Edmund, mean, look, Facebook has an army of lobbyists in Washington now. They're not just a tiny company in Silicon Valley. They got a lot of money. They make a lot of campaign contributions. Is Congress going to have the courage and the technical expertise to really seriously regulate the, these problems of data sharing and what users know about Facebook? I think um, it, it, there certainly isn't a political will. I think, to your second point, technical expertise, I think that is going to be <laughs> the big question mark in terms of you know, it, it requires a real sophisticated understanding of how these systems work that would require either good regulation or whether it's legislation even in the future. And, you know, it, it needs to sort of stand the test of time as well. It can't be something that, you know, you enshrine today that is irrelevant in six months or a year. Uh, and again, that, that's going to come down to technical expertise. Of course, Congress has its lawyers, has its experts. Facebook has its lobbyists, its experts, and they're going to haggle over that. So chances are that they're going to have a good discussion around it. But again, it's something that even Facebook itself isn't always aware of in terms of how their system works or how things will react. So much of it is driven by software and algorithms algorithms, they don't even always know the outcome. And maybe, Edmund, the next time we have you on, uh, we have to bring along an expert in the history of monopolies and, and maybe the power of lobbying in Washington, D.C., because like I said, Facebook is a giant now, and if people want to call it a monopoly or crack down with regulations, uh, they're going to fight back, ultimately. As Mark Zuckerberg said, they're willing to, to engage in some kind of regulation, but we will only go so far. If it comes to the point where it really hurts their business, they're going to draw a red line and say, well, not beyond that point. Edmund Lee, Managing Editor for Recode, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Well, Commissioner, I mean, one of the big questions we were just addressing a minute ago was whether American politicians are essentially going to have the courage to regulate Facebook. And, and in Europe, it seems like they've already mustered that courage. Well, in Europe, there is a different approach. It's called the General Data Protection Regulation. It comes into effect in May. And they're also considering broader e-privacy legislation. It's a different approach than the U.S. approach in that it's really grounded in giving individual users more control and rights to their data. So it allows for individual users, for example, to have more opportunities to say yes or no when their data is being processed by third parties. It includes rights to be informed about how data is being processed, rights to object to that kind of data processing, data portability, data minimization, privacy by design by default. A lot of these concepts, I'd love to point out, are privacy ideas that the Federal Trade Commission and privacy advocates have been advocating for here in the United States as well for a very long time. Now, how many of these protections, or even the spirit of these protections, are on the books, either in law or in regulation here in the United States now? Well, in the United States, we really do rely more on a framework that protects consumers from deception, which means you have to tell consumers and get their consent for data collection and use especially sensitive categories of data. And what's different about what Europe is proposing is the rights really to begin and end with the, with the user. So it's a, it's a framework that gives more rights to individual users than perhaps we have in U.S. law. I mean, I think it's important to say that, that there are some aspects that Congress should pay attention to when thinking about how to better protect Americans' data control and privacy and security, but it may not be practical to totally copy and cut and paste the GDPR into U.S. law because we have different institutions and, and different legal frameworks here, and we have things like the First Amendment, which are very important, um, that, that need to be valued as well. So talk a little bit about the user experience when they're confronting questions of their own privacy, I don't know, let's say in France or Germany, in the EU. 
One of the big questions that came up in hearings yesterday was the idea of opt-in versus opt-out when it's a question of data security. How does that play? This is a, a key question, and for a very long time, the Federal Trade Commission, which is my agency in the United States, has advocated for clear consent and opt-in choices for users when their sensitive information is being collected and processed in some way. Sensitive information includes health information, financial information, children's information. Uh, it also includes geolocation and content of communications. The, the idea there is to say, look, there, there are categories of information that you really need to be giving consumers clear, timely, opt-in choices around. What is in the GDPR framework is very similar. It just is a stronger legal requirement. Well, Commissioner, the FTC offices in Washington are just at the foot of Capitol Hill, not far away at all. So as you've been gazing up Capitol Hill at the House and the Senate, what have you seen over the last year or two about lawmakers' willingness to talk about really regulating Facebook? Well, I think this is a watershed moment. I am encouraged to see a real conversation happening around the kinds of consumer protections that I think consumers need for our highly connected digital world that we live in. We're, we're finally having a conversation at the congressional level, not just about the tools that an agency like the Federal Trade Commission needs, and I think it needs more authority and more tools to protect consumers, but also things like data portability, giving U.S. consumers the same rights that European consumers will have to control their data, to move their data around, and, and to really own their data in a way that, that we currently don't have. I think that's terrific. I also think we need to be having a conversation, and, and I hope we will continue to have this conversation, about increased transparency and accountability for data brokers. There are tons of third parties that you as an individual don't have a direct relationship with that have vast amounts of information about you and are selling those pieces of data. And I think we need to have more transparency and ability to interact with that information as well. Transparency is, is also a key piece of the GDPR framework because it really allows individual users to make sure they can access the information and data that are held about them and uh, know who's using it and for what purposes. Carolyn Sweeney, Commissioner on the Federal Trade Commission since 2014. Commissioner, thank you so much. Thank you. Now, are you willing to change your business model in the interest of protecting individual privacy? Congresswoman, I'm not sure what that means. Well, maybe we can help here. Facebook sells ads against what it knows its users to be interested in. One way, maybe the way that they figure out what you're interested in is the like button, that little thumbs up. It may well be the most powerful tool in social media. Every single time we click on it, we narrow ourselves down beautifully for advertisers and researchers and others. And the very nature of what that button stands for, the validation that a whole lot of people get from it, keeps us coming back for more. Marketplace's Rima Crace explains that. Before you and I knew it as the like button, Facebook developers had another name for it, the awesome button. It's one of those things that was lost in history. Saleo Cuervo helped design the feature about a decade ago. Also lost in history, he says before the blue thumbs up, they experimented with a star symbol, a plus sign. He says the feature kept failing so-called zap reviews. We used to call it the curse of the awesome button because the project felt a little bit cursed. It just always seemed to get stuck in review. Corvo, who now is a design and venture firm, says that's partly because developers were scared that the like or awesome button would make people lazy, that it would lead to less posting. They were dead wrong. Rather than cannibalizing comments, it did the opposite. It created an environment in which people were more motivated to leave posts. The like button officially left product purgatory in 2009. And since then, we've seen iterations of that little iconic symbol all over social media, including on this popular app owned by Facebook. Um, this is my Instagram. Oh, I got a like. Who is it? I don't know who this person is. In Los Angeles, outside a mall with her friend, 23-year-old Gabby Weir scrolls through her Instagram. She shows me pictures of her mimosa-filled brunches at cliff sides in Italy, lots of selfies. And under each carefully worded caption, dozens of likes. I think like my median like is like, I don't know, 115. And she says sometimes if a picture doesn't perform, she'll take it down. Still, Weir says how many likes she gets, not really important. Her friend standing next to her, Amber Tolliver, gives her the side eye. 
but I really couldn't care less what people think of me. Oh, well, yeah, right. <laughs> think of me in terms of like how, you know, how would you know how many likes that you're getting like why would you even think about it if it if it didn't matter to you like no i'm not saying it doesn't matter so it does matter the thing is it matters to a lot of people the reason the like button has been so successful is because people well they like to be liked says adam alter a marketing professor at nyu the experience of getting a like is a lot like a, like a drug taken by someone who's addicted to the drug. It's, it's just a massive dose of reward. It's a huge boost to well-being. Alter says the like button is what makes social media platforms so irresistible. Sort of like a slot machine. You never know how well a post is going to do, so you keep going back. That's how the attention economy works. It's critical that people keep devoting their attention to that particular platform. Otherwise, it loses its key source of revenue. Money, he says, is not the currency here. Our personal data is. The more time we spend on the platform, the more data we're handing over to advertisers. And when we like things on Facebook, we're making their jobs easier. Say I like Lady Gaga on Facebook. I wouldn't really, but if I did, then I could expect to see ads maybe for her concert on my newsfeed. That's not an entirely new concept, says Sandra Matz, a professor of organizational behavior at Columbia University. The new part is that we're now taking those interests and those behaviors and we're translating it into psychological profiles. Matt says researchers have created models tying our likes to certain personality traits. For example, following Lady Gaga means I'm more likely to be an extrovert. And Matt says if you tally up all the likes someone makes on Facebook, personality predictions become that much more accurate. With just 10 likes, she says a computer model can predict your personality better than a colleague could. 150 likes? and it's better than a parent. And around 250 to 300 likes to be better than someone's spouse even. Metz's research shows that targeting ads to people based on their personality led to more clicks and buys. She says this idea of personalization can have a very positive effect on people's lives if it's done right. Um, and if it's done in a way that is more transparent to the user than, than what we currently have. Because without transparency, she says that kind of targeting it can exploit our weaknesses. I'm Raina Price for Marketplace. Here's Republican Senator Lindsey Graham in Tuesday's hearing asking Zuckerberg if his company has any competitors. Is Twitter the same as what you did? It overlaps with the portion of what we do. You don't believe you have a monopoly? Uh, it certainly doesn't feel like that to me. Okay. Yeah. Greg Yip is on the line with us now. He's chief economics commentator for the Wall Street Journal. Good morning, Greg. Hey, good morning. All right, it's a simple question, but let's get it out there. If Facebook is a monopoly, why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem because if you're unhappy with the way Facebook uh, deals with you, either as a user or as an advertiser, you don't really have alternatives. And that's one of the important things that sets Facebook apart from other uh, companies. Uh, if you um, are unhappy with their privacy approach, with the way they sell ads against you, um, you really don't have much choice. You can opt out of certain things, but ultimately the only uh, choice consumers have is to go somewhere else. And there are other social media platforms, but none of them really do what Facebook does. And more important, most of them do not have all the friends that you've accumulated in your network that you already have on Facebook. All right, so at this point, it's going to be hard for any competitor to try to compete with Facebook. Uh, Zuckerberg, on the other hand, says it doesn't feel to him like Facebook is a monopoly. Do you think there's a case to back him up? Well, sure. I mean, uh, he's certain, he doesn't let moss grow under his feet. Uh, Facebook is a terrific service. People love it. You can do things with Facebook that you can't do uh, anywhere else. They bring out new features all the time. And for the typical user, it's all free. I mean, what could be better than that? But on the other hand, if you were to look at some of the usual tests of Monopoly, Facebook seems to meet a lot of them. First of all, there's its market share. 87% of adults uh, use Facebook or one of its products, like Instagram or WhatsApp. Now, it's true that they might be using others as well, but once again, none are just like Facebook. There is the fact that it has these extremely high profit margins, and typically very high profit margins are a sign that there are barriers to entry. It's difficult for other companies to come into this market and do what Facebook does. And they have uh, what we call network effects, which means that as more people join Facebook, it becomes even more useful and more compelling for other people to join Facebook. So for all these reasons, they kind of meet sort of the sniff test for a monopoly or monopoly-like company. So then can lawmakers regulate Facebook without having to officially call it a monopoly, or do they have to, they have to say Facebook's a monopoly and then they can proceed? 
So historically, we have, th this country has taken a very dim view of companies that reach monopoly status and are not regulated. And that is why historically companies that have reached that size, whether it was Standard Oil a century ago or AT&T 20 or 25 years ago, they either end up regulated or there are constraints put on their size or their growth. Now, with Facebook, it's a slightly different question because they haven't been around that long. And it's a very dynamic industry. And Zuckerberg can correctly say that there is nothing guaranteed about their market position today. There are people coming along trying to uh, chip away at it, whether it's <coughs> LinkedIn or Twitter or Snapchat. On the other hand, if you sort of uh, look at um, the capital markets today, it's very difficult for a company to get the capital needed to compete with Facebook. So if you're the government, you sort of say, well, we cannot rely on normal market forces to introduce competitive effects to change uh, Facebook's behavior. And so in those situations in the past, you have put constraints on the behavior of companies like that. Look at Microsoft, for example. Yeah. Uh, or, you, uh, or you break them up. Greg Yip is Chief Economics Commentator for The Wall Street Journal. Thanks so much, Greg. All right, thank you. Uh, Congressman, in general, we collect data from people who have not signed up for Facebook for security purposes to prevent the kind of scraping that you were just referring to. To talk about the many ways Facebook collects data on people and what, if anything, we can do about it, we've reached out to Julia Angwin. She's an investigative reporter formerly at ProPublica. Welcome to the program. It's great to be here. Whether you're on Facebook or not, what are the kinds of attributes Facebook is looking for? What are they looking for in the way of data? Facebook is looking to know basically as much as possible about its users. Things like, this person likes grass, or this person is really interested in a certain type of wrestling. There was one ad category they had, which was a person who likes to pretend to text in awkward situations. You know, these are the kinds of things they'd like to know about you because they're hoping some advertiser will want to buy that ad category. I went and downloaded uh, my Facebook archive to see what they had on me, and some things were not so surprising, right? Uh, topics that I had clicked on, not surprisingly, a lot of public radio stations <laughs> and ads and news sites. Uh, a tremendous number of advertisers from various places I'd shop, whether it was like ASOS or Netflix or AAA or whatever, but then when I went to the contact info section, they didn't have anything. And I wonder if like, there is some measure here of personal responsibility, right? Like, I didn't put that data in, and so they don't have it. Yeah, you didn't put it in, maybe, and so that's why they don't have it. But that's not to say that your contact information is in the other people's files, right? So that's the, the problem, is that even if you limit what you put in, other people may contribute more. For people who hear this and decide that maybe they don't want Facebook to collect all of this information, is there anything they can actually do about it? Well, there's a couple things you can do. One is you can go and work your way through all of Facebook's privacy settings and try to lock them down as much as possible. Another thing you can do to get rid of the tracking that happens when you're not on Facebook you can use ad tracking blocking tools. So they use something called Ghostery, there's something Privacy Badger. There's a bunch of different tools like this and they will say there are 15 different trackers on this website. Do you want to allow any of them? And you can say no. Is there too much focus on Facebook? I mean, when I think about consumer data brokers, right, who are buying and selling information, every brand I've ever dealt with is collected by information and I'm now a customer on one of their customer lists, which they buy and sell. Um, it just seems like this is a small part of the problem that people are focusing on. I mean, I yes and no. Facebook is probably better at collecting so much data about everyone. Um, until two weeks ago when they announced they were ending it, they were actually buying data from data brokers about your offline transactions, and your level of income, your car ownership. They've just said they're going to end that. But the truth is that we're in a world where every business is racing to collect as much data as possible because Google and Facebook have shown that monetizing that data can be extremely lucrative. And so unfortunately, it's true that everyone is racing to get enormous amounts of data about us and we don't have a huge amount of control over that until perhaps Congress maybe steps in with some of the things that they've been discussing in the past few days. That's Julia Angwin. She's an investigative reporter and author of the book Dragnet Nation, a quest for privacy, security, and freedom in a world of relentless surveillance. Julia, thanks for speaking with us. Thank you. Some were surprised to see him in a suit and tie instead of a hoodie, but 
owns a suit. Lived in Silicon Valley, no. He owns a suit. His time on the Hill included some pretty fiery grilling about his history of apologizing. In 2003, it started. And I apologize for any harm done. 2006, we really messed this one up. 2007, we simply did a bad job. I apologize for it. This is proof to me that self-regulation simply does not work. But some parts of the hearing kind of felt a bit like Facebook 101. How do you sustain a business model in which users don't pay for your service? Senator, we run ads. That was Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg in exchanges with Republican Senator Orrin Hatch and before that, Democratic Representative Jan Schakowsky. Domenico, I, I couldn't help cringing at some of what I heard from Congress. I didn't hear the whole hearing this, but what I heard, some of it I was like, have you ever used, do you know what Facebook is? It was a really interesting hearing from the CEO of the Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, you know, it's difficult when you have uh, people in Congress dealing with uh, this kind of technology. It's always kind of awkward because they're not the most, uh, you know, adept at it. You know, you remember John McCain kept his flip phone for a long time. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just what it is. And it's, and I think that there was probably a level of sophistication in the questioning that wasn't available to uh, onlookers uh, because of that. Um, in particular, being able to hold Zuckerberg's feet to the fire on the fact that he kept trying to say that, uh, oh, you know, Facebook, I created it out of my dorm room with my roommate, and, you know, we didn't really know what we were doing, kind of, and, you know, so we've just been sort of winging it for a while. Hold on a second. That was in 2004. That was 14 years ago. Last year, Facebook was valued at half a trillion dollars, right? This is not some startup in your dorm room or a parent's basement. This is one of the largest major corporations in the world, and given all those apologies, it wasn't run like one. I'm Joshua Johnson. You're listening to 1A. Jay? Well, I think something else that was interesting was that you could definitely tell, one, this hearing should have been handled by a group of 22-year-olds, and two, a lot of the questions seem very reflective of a, a, of a sense of Facebook's power that isn't very accurate. For instance, they got more questions about conservative activists Diamond and Silk than they did about Facebook's role in perhaps perpetuating a genocide in Myanmar, you know, by deleting posts by, you know, members of a ethnic minority group and by, you know, kind of really participating in that, and they didn't really get asked about that, but Tim Cruz was sure to ask about whether or not, you know, Trump activists Diamond and Silk were getting their posts shut down, which turns out to may or may not have been a hoax. And it just, it was a really interesting reflection of that a lot of times these congressional hearings, they do, it's, it, you know, you saw Facebook's um, stock prices rising, and I was like, yo, this made Mark Zuckerberg look way better and made Congress look way worse. Mark wrote on our Facebook page, Facebook is taking the grilling now, however, privacy concerns abound on the web. We need comprehensive internet privacy rules. Now, Tali, what exactly could we expect in terms of something concrete, legislation, regulation, to do something about these concerns about Facebook? I mean, I think that's the key question. These things are always spectacles. Every once in a while, a movie star or a business star or somebody like that makes their way to Capitol Hill, and these senators who are pretty much inured to celebrity when it comes to Washington seem remarkably like star like starstruck uh, teenagers when it comes to these other folks. And this really was one because Mark Zuckerberg is a 33-year-old guy, you know, incredibly wealthy, probably the youngest guy in the room facing off against these octogenarians. But the real question is what will come out of this? And given Congress's history, given Congress's seeming inability to understand some of these questions, I guess history doesn't really inspire a lot of confidence that we're going to have any kind of comprehensive uh, legislation. There were like that moment from Warren Hatch. You could tell that Zuckerberg had been grilled to be polite and deferential, but it was almost like he couldn't believe what he was hearing, that that, that, that question would actually be posed to him. There was this moment of silence as he sort of seems to be registering that they're actually asking him that ba something that basic. So in my sense, in, you know, my sense is that there, we shouldn't expect a lot of far-reaching legislation out of this. Domenico, were there any big reveals from Mark Zuckerberg's testimony? Did he say anything that was new or, or, or significant, startling, that kind of reshaped our understanding of either Facebook or its role in the world? Well, I mean, the biggest sort of alert-worthy thing that happened was uh, him revealing that uh, 
people at Facebook have been in contact with the investigators from the from the uh, Mueller uh, investigation. So knowing that, uh, there could be another avenue of news that uh, comes out when it comes to Russian interference in the 2016 campaign. And Jane, if Capitol Hill did regulate Facebook, do we have any sense of what that might look like? I, I kind of began to feel from some of the line of questioning that it had to do with what some members of Congress felt was a monopoly that Facebook had and basically had its arms in a lot of different things. I think back to John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil, which was broken into 30 different co companies, basically. I I'm not sure how you regulate a company that's that big in the internet, like, other than breaking it up. But I, I don't even know if that's been, if anyone's even thought it through that far. Exactly. And I think that one of the funniest things is Facebook would absolutely love to be regulated because that would, in a sense, be treating it like a public utility. That is endless government money, in a sense, because someone has to pay to regulate the entity in question. And this idea that, like, it's been so funny to see all these Republicans who, on the one hand, are like free enterprise and free, you know, these corporations should be allowed to act as they will, except for these certain ones. And it, it's just, it's really interesting because it clearly, the concept of regulating a business, regulation means something. And there needs to be, you know, an understanding of what would that look like? How would you break it up? Would you, you know, would you split off Instagram? What did this actually mean? And there's no, there's no real answer to yet. Kevin tweeted, come on now, Hatch was giving Zuckerberg a softball question. Of course Hatch knows how they make money. He even alluded to it in his summary. And Peggy wrote on our Facebook page, Listen, my family uses Facebook, my friends, my constituents. We all use Facebook. I use Facebook. It's wonderful for our seniors to connect with their relatives. For all of the benefits that Facebook has provided in building communities and connecting families, um, I think a devil's bargain has been struck. Best Democratic Congresswoman Kathy Castor, who had a lengthy exchange with Zuckerberg about Facebook collecting everyone's data, including people who don't have Facebook. Zuckerberg has admitted that Facebook does collect data from non-users for security purposes. But you're following Facebook users even after they log off of that platform and application. And you are collecting personal information on people who do not even have Facebook accounts. Isn't that right? Congresswoman, I believe that... Yes or no? Uh, Congresswoman, I, I'm not sure. That, I don't think that that's what we're tracking. And for his U.S. Democratic Senator Bill Nelson, too, had privacy concerns. He sat on the Senate committee that grilled Zuckerberg for hours. Let me just cut to the chase. If you and other social media companies do not get uh, your act in order, none of us are going to have any privacy anymore. Uh, that's what we're facing. At the crux of the hearings is how 87 million people's personal data may have been compromised for use by a political research firm called Cambridge Analytica, which Nelson asked Zuckerberg about. He told Zuckerberg that when he first heard the breach, he should have let those affected know. When we learned in 2015 that Cambridge Analytica had bought data from an app developer on Facebook that people had shared it with, we did take action. We took down the app, and we demanded that both the app developer and Cambridge Analytica delete and stop using any data that they had. They told us that they did this. In retrospect, it was clearly a mistake to believe them, and yeah. we should have followed up and done a full audit then, and that is not a mistake that we will make. Yes, you did that, and you uh, apologized for it, but you didn't notify them. Do you think that you have an ethical obligation to notify 87 million Facebook users? Zuckerberg could be facing even more questions from the European Union. He's already admitted that close to 3 million people who are part of the EU may have also been affected by the data scandal. For Florida Public Radio... And this week, after two days of congressional testimony from Mark Zuckerberg, we ask what we still need to know about the data Facebook collects on all of us. And we talk to the Cambridge Psychometrics Centre about Cambridge University's involvement in the Facebook data scandal. Plus, from the TED conference in Vancouver, we have a report on the continuing battle against fake news. Joining me to help us through all that is BBC Technology reporter Zoe Kleinman. Hello, Zoe. Hello. And my special guest is Frederica Kaltweiner from Privacy International. Welcome, Frederica. Hello. Good to have you here and your expertise, which will be needed, I can tell you. Here's a flavour of what's in the show. In a couple of days, 
a lot of fake news about Ukraine appeared in Russian media. And uh, we, Ukrainian journalists, we were shocked. We didn't know what to do. The UN or like app always had consent from individuals for the data to be used for academic and business purposes because QBU and our logo was on the website. Stay listening for all of that and more. Now, it was a two-day interrogation with dozens of questions. Some of them acute, some of them rambling, a few, well, quite bizarre. Mark Zuckerberg managed, for the most part, to parry the blows during his appearance before congressional committees in Washington. But several intriguing questions about the extent of the data Facebook collects and how much control users have over it left him pretty uncomfortable. So, Clement, take us through a couple of those questions. Well, it certainly was a mixed bag, wasn't it, Rory? I think some of those senators seem to spend nearly all of their allotted four minutes phrasing their one question, which was really frustrating. But some of them did really hit home. Have a listen to this one from Senator Dick Durbin. Mr. Zuckerberg, would you be comfortable sharing with us the name of the hotel you stayed in last night? Um... <laughs> messaged anybody this week, would you share with us the names of the people you've messaged? Uh, Senator, no, I would probably not choose to do that publicly here. I think that may be what this is all about. Your right to privacy, the limits of your right to privacy, and how much you give away in modern America in the name of, quote, connecting people around the world. The question, basically, of um, what information Facebook's collecting, who they're sending it to, and whether they ever ask me in advance my permission to do that. Is that a fair thing for a user of Facebook to expect? I think everyone should have control over how their information is used. Oh, it's a bit awkward to listen to, isn't it? But of course, it's a very practical example of exactly what the nub of this issue is around data privacy. You could argue that Mark Zuckerberg hadn't put the hotel on Facebook either. But of course, there is that notorious check-in feature which encourages people to do just that. And once you have checked in somewhere, as I've discovered now we're all busy going over all of our data, it remains attached to your profile for years. But do people actually have that kind of control? The following day, this issue was raised by Congressman Ben Luhan. Facebook has detailed profiles on people who have never signed up for Facebook, yes or no? Uh, Congressman, in general, we collect data from people who have not signed up for Facebook for security purposes to prevent the kind of scraping that you were just referring to. So these are called shadow profiles? Is that what they've been referred to by some? Uh, Congressman, I'm not... I'm not familiar with that. I'll refer, I'll refer to them as shadow profiles for today's uh, hearing. It may surprise you that we've not talked about this a lot today. Um, you said everyone controls their data, but you're collecting data on people that are not even Facebook users that have never signed a consent, a privacy agreement, and you're collecting their data. And it may surprise you that on Facebook's page, when you go to, I don't have a Facebook account, and would like to request all my personal data stored by Facebook, it takes you to a form that says, go to your Facebook page, and then on your account settings, you can download your data. So you're directing people that don't have access, don't, don't even have a Facebook page to have to sign up for a page to release their data. We've got to fix that. Now this ring, rings a bell with me, Rory, and it, it sort of brought me back to something we reported here on the BBC a couple of years ago. Listen to this. In 2015, a Belgian court ruled that it was unacceptable that every time someone clicked a like button on a website, their browsing activity was collected regardless of whether they were Facebook users or not. Researchers found that even non-members who visited any net page that fell under the facebook.com domain would have what Facebook called a data cookie, which had a two-year lifespan installed on their browser. Well, that's, uh, that's extraordinary, Zoe. Thank you for that. Um, uh, our special guest, Frederica Kaltzmeyer from Privacy International, she was nodding during that. Frederica, uh, that certainly rings a bell for you, doesn't it? It certainly does. What was so interesting for us doing this hearing is that Mark Zuckerberg likes to talk about content and information. So those are the things that we share. And his solutions are c uh, controls and more settings. He, he was notoriously vague when it came to, comes to things like tracking and profiling. And we know that Facebook engages in tracking. It uses cookies to track users' uh, browsing histories around the web. It uses invisible pixels. And it also uses the notorious like and share button. So tell us about, so that, that, that applies to people who are members of Facebook, but it's also collecting uh, data from people who have never belonged to Facebook. How does that work? 
So that is an important question that Facebook should be answering. So they have, um, against this Belgium case that is ongoing, Facebook rejects or denies that this is happening. I think whenever you visit a page that has a like button, it installs a cookie on your, on your browser, and this allows you to be tracked. Now, you, uh, you, you've got concerns that this is not just about Facebook. Um, you've been looking at the business of data brokers uh, who are more generally collecting data on all of us. Tell us more. Who are they? How do they fit into the broader picture? So I think countless of country, uh, companies have data about you, and in principle that's not a problem. When it gets problematic is when this happens without your knowledge or consent. Most people do not know that data brokers exist. Most people do not understand how apps on their phone use trackers to track what you're doing. A good example that came out last week was the gay dating app Grindr. They use third-party trackers uh, to understand how their app functions, but it turned out that the app collects data on, on people's self-disclosed HIV statuses. So those are uh, generally problematic practices. So I think they're good companies, but bad practices, and a lot of bad practices are unfortunately very mainstream. Uh, and how uh, likely is it that you'll be able to get hold of that data now? We've got this new European Data Protection Regulation. For instance, if I want to know what a credit agency has on me, they're bound to have a ton, how easy would it be for me to find that out? Credit agencies are easier, but data brokers are exceptionally challenging. Um, they collect data about you with an ID. You need to know the ID in order to get access to that data. Um, and I think this is a problem. These are non-consumer facing companies and yet they collect a lot of data points on people. Let's, let's uh, end this little section with a verdict on Mark Zuckerberg's overall performance. Uh, Zoe first, you go first. What was your overall verdict on it? He was more impressive and more human than I was expecting him to be. I'll say that. I think I think he had a hard time, rightly so. Um, it was kind of awkward, wasn't it? Um, I felt I wish some of the senators had been a bit more on point, let's say, with with their approach to questions. Yeah, Frederica, very briefly, what's your verdict? It was a tough hearing, but I think for a company that makes uh, millions of dollars and billions of dollars, just to say sorry is not enough. Okay, and we'll be coming back to uh, more of the issues uh, that came up in that hearing later in the program. Now let's have a quick look at a couple of other tech stories with Zoe. Uh, the latest on that ultra-secret messaging app, Telegram. Yes, this is the, the, the app that's much loved by sort of uh, cyber security researchers, isn't it? Because it's, it's supposed to have this top security. Well, it's, uh, you're no longer be, going to be able to get it in Russia. A court in Moscow has approved a request from the Russian media regulator to block it immediately. The regulator said it wanted to block the app because the firm wouldn't hand over encryption keys used to scramble messages. The firm, I think, said it doesn't have them and, you know, it, it's not possible for them to hand them over. But security officials are saying they need to monitor potential Terrorists. We founded this organization when um, Russian unmarked soldiers entered the Crimean Peninsula four years ago. In, in a couple of days, a lot of fake news about Ukraine appeared in Russian media. And uh, we, Ukrainian journalists, we were shocked. We didn't know what to do, but we uh, understood that we should do something. I uh, offered the idea to create a website to collect examples of fake news, debunk them with um, verifiable proofs like photos, videos, uh, strong evidence. Um. So this began as something very much targeted about, about Ukraine and Russia, but it has grown into something far more since then. Yes, uh, yeah, we, we have 11 language versions, um, mostly European countries. Now in Europe, Russia used the same techniques that it um, tested in Ukraine. Russian propaganda adjusts in the same way European issues like migrant crisis, for example. Yeah. Yeah, well, we've now seen uh, investigations from the US Senate into whether Russian bots influenced the presidential election. There's question marks over whether it influenced other European elections. So this has become a real issue. What, what tips would you give to the average newsreader that's scanning Facebook for stories, what sort of simple things can they do to distinguish fake news from real news? I, um, I want to suggest to pay attention if there are some uh, concrete information, some specific information in this news, like names, like addresses, like, like cities, like countries, for example, like um, numbers, etc., etc., photos, videos. Uh, if you uh, don't have any proofs, 
in the news, in the piece of news, uh, 99% that it's fake news. The, the definition of fake news is changing. Some people see fake news as just things that don't confirm their own sort of biases. How do you reach out to people who are sort of in, in an information bubble and just want to believe things and want news to sort of reiterate their, their biases? Hmm. Uh, we don't know exactly how to reach these people. Uh, we, uh, I think we have our own audience who look for truth. Yes, and I think we should uh, reach this information to them. You say in your TED talk that fake news threatens society and democracy. You also said that we're getting to a stage where people are starting to not believe anything and that that in itself is a very dangerous situation. What do you think we can do to stop that happening? It's, it's a task for all of our society. New technologies brought new challenges to us. But I think we can uh, agree about new rules of law, um, about new rules of uh, game. Olga Yakova speaking to Jane Wakefield, uh, Frederica Councilman of Privacy International, our special guest. Uh, are we winning this battle against fake news? It's incredibly complicated. There are many authoritarian governments around the world that love this debate because they engage in censorship. And there's a fine line between false facts and false or misleading narratives. Even traditional media sometimes report false narratives. Everybody gets something wrong from time to time. True. So uh, if you charge platforms with making these very political decisions, that's a problem. But I think the at the core of the issue, uh, one piece of the puzzle is uh, the data ecosystem behind. If you can target people with messages, uh, that means that you can spread information more precisely. Okay, uh, we'll be back to that, I'm sure. Now back to the Facebook data scandal, and we're going to look at how Cambridge University is in the spotlight over the behaviour of its academics. It was the university's Dr. Alexander Kogan who collected Facebook data via a personality quiz for the political consultancy Cambridge Analytica. During his testimony on Wednesday, Mark Zuckerberg had this to say about the university. What we found now is that there's a whole program associated with Cambridge University where a number of researchers, not just Alexander Kogan, although to our current knowledge, he's the only one who sold the data to Cambridge Analytica, there are a number of other researchers who are building similar apps. So we do need to understand whether there is something bad going on at Cambridge University overall that will require a stronger action from us. A few hours before Mr. Zuckerberg said that, I was visiting the university's psychometric center, which had got embroiled broiled in the whole realm last weekend. A company called QU, which had worked with the center on another personality quiz, was banned from Facebook. Although, as you'll hear, the academics involved to say there should be no comparison with the app made by Alexander Kogan. But when I sat down with Vesely Popov, Business Development Director at the Psychometric Centre, I asked him what Dr. Kogan's work had done to the reputation of the university. Well, he was never anything to do with the Psychometric Centre, but uh, regardless of that, he was still part of the University of Cambridge. So Dr. Kogan had, would say and has assured the university and also us that everything he did was nothing to do with his university duties. Whether or not that might still be a breach of professional ethics from the perspective of the British Psychological Society is, is another matter, I guess. So our opinion is that even if an academic does something quote unquote in their spare time with their own company, they still ought to be held to uh, professional standards as a psychologist because like it or not, they're still representing that body and the university in doing it. Has the university been rigorous enough in overseeing that kind of activity? Because after all, it, it knew what had happened. He tried to bring that data back into the university for his academic use and it was turned down. Shouldn't that have sent uh, warning signals? So we, we had seen a number of warning signals after Dr. Hogan made his assurances to the university and we reported all of those to the university um, as, soon as, as soon as they were seen. Now, the Psychometric Centre itself came under the spotlight uh, a few days ago through its collaboration with a company called QBU, uh, which ran a personality quiz rather similar to what Dr. Cogan had done to gather data. Why do you say that that was not also questionable? Uh, well, first of all, I'd say it isn't really similar to what Dr. Cogan did. The You Are What You Like app was opt-in only, uh, and even though it got friends' data, there was a reason for getting that friends' data, because the actual predictions were shown in the interface. So as part of, in line with Facebook's policies at the time, 
it was possible to get friends likes and those friends likes were used to provide a social experience in the app. Uh, just, a, just a minute, had those friends opted in though? Did those friends know that their data was being used in that way? Well, no, no more than any other Facebook app at, at the time, but we haven't used any of that friend's data in our research. And importantly, the difference is there's, there was a reason to get that data in the app, whereas Dr. Kogan only got friend's data in order to amass a larger database uh, for his commercial purposes. Secondly, the You Are What You Like app always had consent from individuals for the data to be used for academic and business purposes because CubeU and our logo was on the website, whereas Dr. Kogan's app, from what we've seen, told people it was for academic research, but then he actually put it into the GSR company and sold it on. Hasn't this, though, cast quite a shadow over the reputation of Cambridge as a place where data would be used responsibly? People are going to see it as a place where it's used irresponsibly. Well, I don't think the actions of one academic ought to cast out on the rest of the amazing work that happens in the university. I think that the, the issue we have is that most research of this kind is actually taking place not in universities but in companies, big tech companies like Facebook and Google and Amazon with data scientists, many of whom don't have psychological or ethical training to the standard that you know, academic researchers need to have. They also don't need to seek ethical approval for their internal product development in the way that researchers do. But most of the methodologies and techniques for analysing this data are actually sitting within the private sector and therefore are not subject to public scrutiny and open debate in the way that a university research institution or you know, any uni published university research is. And what's your overall view of how Facebook has handled this whole affair? I think they're very quick to try and find others to put responsibility on. Uh, when it's very clear that Cambridge Analytica and, and these kinds of companies are the product of an environment to which Facebook has contributed greatly. Uh, it absolutely isn't the case that privacy is protected by default on platforms such as Facebook, and that's still true today. Although they might be making some changes now in response to the public and regulatory pressure, this needs to be seen as, as an outcome of you know, very permissive attitudes towards those companies. The Sally Popoff of the Cambridge Psychometric Centre. And we asked Dr. Alexander Kogan for a response to the comments about him. He said he was surprised by Mr. Popoff's comments as he had discussions with academics at the centre about their project, uh, about their participation in that project back in uh, 2014. He said, in truth, the Psychometric Centre never had an ethical issue with the project, as far as I'm aware. And he insists the relationship only went sour after a dispute over how much the centre would be paid for his involvement, not over any ethical concerns. Mr. Popoff said this wasn't accurate. He stood by what he said in our interview. Let's pull this out. Frederica Kaltoner from Privacy International. Are we in danger of saying all research with data, whether it's for academic or commercial purposes, is bad and we should, we should just stop it? There's a difference between research and data harvesting. Social science research into technology is incredibly important if it's done ethically and legally. For example, during the hearing, Mark Zuckerberg threw in the word AI tools. That's a brand new area that deserves a lot more research. Are these tools biased? Do they discriminate? And the fact that a lot of research is happening in companies... But you're going to have to, as a researcher, you're going to have to get hold of people's Facebook data to do that. That is true, but you can ask them about their consent. You can ask them to consent. You can explain exactly what you're doing. This is not what has happened in, in the Cambridge Analytica case. Let's briefly bring in Zoe Kleinman again. Zoe, do you think we all feel more or less comfortable about our data, whether it's being mangled by university researchers or commercial researchers after this week? I think if there was as much outrage as we are seeing in the media, then there'd be nobody left on Facebook. I don't know anyone that's left it, do you? It doesn't seem to me that people are voting with their feet, and that, I think, would be a real indication that, that Facebook users have had enough. It doesn't look to me like they have. Uh, briefly, Frederica, have you left Facebook? Have you ever joined Facebook? I'm on Facebook, but my data was also in the Cambridge Analytica data set. Oh, so you're a victim too? I'm a victim. It's Which personal. Is, it's personal. It's personal. Uh, and as ever, this story's going to run and run. We, we've run out of time. Thanks to my special guest. Up next on point, the EU, digital privacy and free speech. First, this news. WBUR Boston and NPR, and this is On Point. Next 
month, the European Union will begin enforcing what advocates are calling the most comprehensive set of 21st century digital privacy laws in the world. They're sweeping new consumer protections that put users, not tech companies, in control of their own data. Now, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg told Congress that he would extend those privacy controls beyond Europe, but maybe not, because there's news recently that Facebook is quietly moving 1.5 billion global users in a way that might put their data beyond the reach of the EU's new rules. So the question is, why can't Americans enjoy similar di digital privacy laws, similar legal protections? Well, when you read the fine print, it turns out that the EU's version of privacy may clash with American notions of free speech. This hour on point, new data protections in the EU and what they could mean for privacy in the U.S. You can join us on air or online. We're at 1-800-423-8255. That's 800-423-TALK. And really want to know what you think in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal and the fact that 87 million Facebook users' uh, data was used without their consent for political purposes. Do you think it's high time that EU-style private digital privacy laws came to the United States? Or are you concerned with things like the right to be forgotten and could that inadvertently lead to censorship or the the uh, the uh, or, or or blocking free speech in the United States so what's your take on this you can find us online at onpointradio.org or on twitter and facebook at on Point Radio. Well, I've been talking a lot uh, about Mark Zuckerberg here, so let's just remind folks uh, that Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook did testify before Congress in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. And during that testimony, Democratic Texas Congressman Gene Green asked Zuckerberg how international differences in data privacy protections could affect American Facebook users. Did I understand correctly that Facebook would not only make the same settings available, but that will make the same protections available to Americans that they will to Europeans? Yes, Congressman, all the same controls will be available around the world. Okay. And you commit today that Facebook will extend the same protections to Americans that European users, users will receive under the GDPR? Yes, Congressman, we believe that everyone around the world deserves good privacy controls. We've had a lot of these controls in place for years. The GDPR requires us to do a few more things, and we're going to extend that to the world. That's CEO, uh, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg testifying before Congress there. So you heard them mention this thing, the GDPR. Those are the European Union's new rules set to go into effect next month. Joining us now to explain is Tom Wheeler. He was chairman of the Federal Communications Commission here in the United States from 2013 to 2017 under President Obama. He's now a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Tom Wheeler, welcome to On Point. Hello, Meg. Nice to be here. So first of all, I guess, let's just start with the GDPR 101 here. <laughs> when we say that, what do we mean? General Data Protection Regulations. What, what is the European Union about to do? Well, they're going to do something that um, is a first. I mean, you can consider it uh, crossing the Rubicon, I guess, uh, maybe crossing the digital Rubicon. Um, that, and, and the effect of it will be, for the first time, to reorient what is happening online around the consumer and the consumer's information rather than around the company. I mean, there are two there are two principal issues here. I think one is that developers um, tend to build first and then think what are the consequences later. Right. And business people seize on that to say, well, the more data that we can collect, the greater the targeting that we can sell. And so, what GDPR tries to do is to go at both of those by by first saying you have to have privacy by design. Uh -huh. It has to be a forethought, not an afterthought. And then you need to make the collection of the information fit the usage. Because right now what we have going on is 
How can you siphon off as much information as possible, even though it really isn't necessary to the delivery of this particular service? Right. So just to, so uh, uh, let's go down here a degree to the level of some some of the specific things. So that that's the sort of big umbrella in terms of the shift in in, in who should have control uh, over the data. Um, uh, but some of the specific measures that you know regarding consent, right? Companies right. won't be able to use vague or confusing language in their uh, terms of service. I suppose those terms of service that only the most obsessive amongst us even read right now. Um, and they're not going to be able to bundle consent for different things together. That's interesting right. to me because beforehand, I mean, you just had to scroll through pages and pages and pages of legalistic language. So the EU is going to do away with all that and just make it more clear uh, and separate in terms of what you're opting into and saying yes to? Yeah, the, the key concept here is that it's the consumer's information. And the consumer has the right to provide informed consent um, about what's being collected and how it's being used. So they, so they need to opt in before the information can be collected. They can't be coerced into, well, if you don't say we can have this information, then we can't, we won't give you the service. It can't be hidden in paragraph 87 of the legal fine print. Right. Uh, and 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 probably one of the hidden things here is the concept of portability, where your information remains your information, even if it's on somebody else's server, and you can take it with you. Mm. Because it's yours, not theirs. Okay, so what are some of the implications of that? Well, I think the implications are that it's going to force companies to think about privacy uh, first, rather than scramble to catch up. I mean, with all due respect, the, and, and there have been, been incredible things that we have seen uh, developed and coming out of Silicon Valley, and we should all celebrate that. But the, the, the ethos has, has, has tended to be, well, let's see if we can build, you know, fill in the blank, and then we'll deal with the consequences later on. Yeah, the move fast, break things. Exactly. Zuckerberg. Exactly. And, then, and I think what GDPR is saying, no, 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 you have to do it by design. You have to say, here's what I need to deliver on this product that I am building. Yeah. And that's what you can get. You gotta think about privacy ahead of time rather than after the fact. So again, uh, just a little bit more detail here. I mean, uh, the, the new EU rules are gonna require that for children under the age of 16, uh, someone with parental responsibility has to opt in to all of this. Uh, there's gonna be uh, mandatory uh, guidelines for companies that they have to notify uh, the data protection authority in their country about a data breach within 72 hours of right. becoming aware of it, that's really interesting. Um, and then, this is one I want to come back to in detail in a second, but I just want to mention it now. The right to be forgotten, um, and that is you can ask whoever is controlling your data to erase it and potentially stop third parties from processing it as well. That's the one I think that could uh, be a little sticky here in the United States, and so I want to come back to that in a second. But, but Tom Wheeler, I mean, just give me your take here. Um, what's preventing uh, similar laws from from being made here in the United States. I mean, the EU is also, I should mention, adding some teeth to it, right? Like companies can be fined up to 20 million euros if they don't comply. Well, back then, you know, well, we tried to do this uh, when I was chairman of the FCC insofar as the networks that connect you to the internet are. You know, we, we've we spent a lot of time in the last couple of weeks focusing on Facebook, but Facebook is one website, right? Or yeah. several websites. The, the networks that take you there, AT&T or Comcast or, or whomever, they see all the websites you go to. They see everything you're doing. So we put in place rules that were very similar in concept, an opt-in concept in the transparency of what information is being collected um, that applied to the networks. We, we couldn't apply them to the platforms like Facebook and Google because the FCC doesn't have jurisdiction. But we applied it where we had jurisdiction. And 67 days after the Trump Republican Congress came in, Congress passed a law repealing it and went so far as to say that 
the FCC to pass a law that said the FCC could never again have those kind of privacy rules. Hmm. So we have a basic uh, underpinning issue uh, in the United States where there needs to be a willingness of our elected officials to step up and say, no, I represent the consumers whose information privacy is being violated. And that hasn't been the orientation of the Congress to this point. Yeah. Well, we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, you're listening to Tom Wheeler. He was chairman of the FCC from 2013 to 2017 under President Obama. We're talking about the European Union and the fact that next month it's about to begin enforcing so it's possibly the most comprehensive 21st century set of data privacy laws. And, you know, the details around that and the implications for the rest of the world, including uh, data privacy here in the United States. Tom, stand back for just a quick second because I want to bring into the conversation Alex Hearn. Uh, he's a tech reporter for The Guardian UK and he joins us from London because we want to get the view here from Europe. Alex, welcome to On Point. Um, so Tom Wheeler sort of got us started in talking about the details of these new EU uh, regulations around data privacy. We just got a minute here before the break because I want to quickly ask you, um, has there been any, been any pushback in the European Union itself from tech companies about the sweeping nature of these new rules? I think we've had a very interesting timing. Uh, until about November, um, almost no one even within the EU was really paying much attention to it. A lot of companies were waiting for the official guidance published by the European Union's Article 29 Working Party, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it's the European body which, uh, which provides guidance, which provides oversight for these areas. Come November that was published, uh, and companies then realised that actually GDPR was quite a lot larger than they thought it was going to be. But, you know, they, they began the process of working through it and talking about it. And then I think just at the moment when they might start campaigning, the Facebook scandal broke. Right, so hang in there for a sec, just, just, just a second, Alex, because we have to take a quick break here, uh, but we're going to pick up where you left off. That's Alex Hearn, he's tech reporter for The Guardian uh, UK. We're also joined today by Tom Wheeler, former FCC chairman. Uh, and we were talking about the European Union's new digital privacy laws and whether we could see anything like that here in the United States. We'll be back in just a moment. I think the United States needs to have stronger digital privacy laws here, something with real teeth in it, like the European Union has. Or are you slightly concerned that maybe the EU is going too far with things like its right to be forgotten and could that trample on American notions of free speech online. Again, we're at 1-800-423-8255. That's 800-423-TALK. I'm joined today by Tom Wheeler. He was former chairman of the FCC from 2013 to 2017. He's now a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. And by Alex Hearn, tech reporter for The Guardian UK. He's with us from London. Uh, Alex, before the break there, you were talking about the fact that um, even in the European Union with the sweeping change, many people weren't paying attention to the coming changes until the Cambridge Analytica scandal broke. Exactly. Well, it, you know, it was all about the same time, really, that uh, over the past, it's only really been four or five months that uh, anyone except the, the extreme specialists has been paying attention. And I think just as, as the lobbying effort might have kicked into uh, top gear, just as the public was starting to become aware of GDPR, the Facebook scandal broke and completely changed the tenor of the conversation. Uh, I, I don't think right now you would get much leeway if you tried to argue that there is a serious institutional problem with the way data is handled uh, across the world, but, yeah. but in Europe as much as anywhere else. You know, I am seeing here though, since we're talking about Facebook again, it, it's, it is the 800 or to 2 billion pound uh, gorilla in the room here. Um, that even though Mark Zuckerberg, when testifying before Congress, said that he was going to, uh, they're going to unroll GDPR type regulate uh, options, controls, I should say, for Facebook users around the world, which they are doing simultaneously. Just uh, what last week, the, you reported in the Guardian that um, Facebook is quietly moving data for one and a half billion global users away from its Irish terms of service into U.S. terms of service. What's going on there? So it's not data that they're moving. Okay. It's important to be clear that all, all they're doing is they're changing uh, the terms of service that users outside of Europe and the US and Canada agree to. It used to be that the US and Canada agreed to terms of service, you know, a, a binding legal contract with Facebook's Menlo Park headquarters and everywhere else in the world. 
agreed to terms of service operated through Ireland, which is Facebook's international HQ. Now, if you're outside of Europe, that, that document is officially in agreement with Facebook uh, incorporates with the with the US body of Facebook. Okay, so it means, so, oh sorry, I was just gonna say, does that mean that, that if their uh, user wanted to take legal action, they would have to do it in a US court versus an Irish one? Almost certainly, exactly that. It's one of those things, one of the interesting things about European law, really, across the board, and GDPR is no exception, is it, it, it's created and enforced somewhat differently from US and UK law. It, it, it tends to be sort of deliberately vague until after it gets worked out through uh, national level enforcement, through national level case law, and through the way it gets written into uh, national governments. All of which is to say that I have not been able to get a clear answer, even from experts in this area, about what the effect of this change actually is. Facebook's given its clear answer. Facebook says that the reason why it did that is just to make it easier to do things like notify individuals outside of the EU of data breaches, because GDPR and now the Irish Terms of Service include a few specific European uh, unique to Europe phrases like data protection controller, which Facebook says uh, isn't really relevant if you're outside of Europe. But on the other hand, you're, you're, you're quoting folks like uh, privacy researchers who say moving one and a half billion users into other jurisdictions is not a simple copy and paste exercise, so there's more going on here. Exactly that. So, so the thing is, uh, other people are arguing that this change does actually have a, a significant effect, specifically in terms of who uh, who is liable, who can leave Facebook liable for these swinging fines that, uh, that GDPR allows European data controllers to levy right. up to 4% of global turnover, which is, which is billions in Facebook's case. Okay, so uh, let, me, so let me just go back to Tom Wheeler here. Tom, I, want, I heard you want to jump in there, because I'm just curious yeah. what you make of all this, and, and then I guess that leads me to the question of like, what effect really might these EU regulations have globally, if any? <laughs> So, Magda, I think that Alex made a really good point about how we're in the first inning. Sorry, Alex, I'm going to use an American sports metaphor. Um, we're in the first inning of, of this, um, and, and what is significant is that the game is on. As I said, it's crossing a Rubicon here. Um, and what's going to have to happen is that national governments um, uh, and, and the EU and the US are going to have to come to grips with, okay, how do we implement these kinds of ideas specifically? What, you know, as a former regulator, uh, I can tell you that what legislators do is to give you broad parameters uh, because they can't get that detailed in a piece of legislation and things change too rapidly. And so what a regulator has to do is say, okay, here are the broad concepts I have to operate in. How do I reflect this, uh, these concepts against the reality that I find? And therefore you end up getting shades of gray. We debate things in terms of black and white, but the actual implementation is much more nuanced. And that's what we're gonna see now. We're now moving into how do you effectuate this kind of concept that the consumer comes first. I mean, that is a huge step. So Tom, let me just jump in here, because that leads me directly to uh, the one part of the GDPR, of these new EU regulations, that I, we haven't explored in depth and really need to, about the right to be forgotten. Alex, can you just walk us through briefly like, what, that, what that means in terms of these new data privacy laws? So the right to be forgotten isn't a new right in the European Union. It's, uh, it was established as a corollary of the right to privacy a few years back. And so far, until the introduction of GDPR, um, it has been interpreted as uh, allowing individuals to demand uh, the removal of, of outdated or misleading information about them. It's largely been applied uh, almost entirely, really, in the public sphere through requests made to Google. Um, to remove search entries about individuals. Uh, some of that is, is obviously um, exactly what you'd expect. It is, it is people who were, you know, in an embarrassing situation in their, in their school days who 20 years on would just like the local newspaper article about how they ran naked through the university court to, to maybe not be the top result for them, mm -hmm. for a search they made. It has, uh, it has been contested 
quite heavily for more, for more specific instances. There was a court case in London just this month in which uh, it, it was, there were a lot of reporting restrictions on it, but in which two men uh, sued Google to remove two news articles about okay. former uh, criminal conviction. Right. Okay, so, so this follow, is... Following GDPR... Sorry, go on. No, no, go ahead. You go finish that thought, and then I, just, and then I want to bring in another guest to respond to this. GDPR, following GDPR, it's been made uh, much more explicit. It's... Uh, it, it, it introduces a right for individuals to have personal data erased. Uh, they can make a request. They have to get a response within one month. But GDPR is also uh, very explicit that the right is not absolute. Um, it, it, it only applies in certain situations. If the personal data is no longer necessary for the purpose it was gathered, or if uh, it uh, specifically has stronger implications for data gathered around children, right? If there are there are checks and balances built into this. Okay, great. So there were before, but they are different, I think, from checks and balances that the US would settle for on its own. So on, on that point, um, since you, you did mention that this has been uh, sort of adjudicated in your uh, in European courts a couple of times, I just want to play a quick a bit of tape here because. Uh, in 2014, there was this landmark case in the European Court of Justice over the right to be forgotten. Um, and, and Alex, as you mentioned, giving people the right to ask Google to remove unwanted links from search results. And just after that uh, ruling came out, uh, Craig Newman, who's a lawyer, explained explained it to CNN shortly after the, the ruling was handed down. You have a right to call Google and say, I want to take that down. But that information is already lawfully on the internet. So it's a bit like saying, it's okay to have this book in your library, but you're not allowed to use Google as a card catalog to find it. And as Alex Hearn was just telling us, the new European Union regulations go even further, giving people the right not just to be forgotten, but to ask companies to delete their data. So I want to get some response uh, on that point from Scott Shackelford. He's a professor of business law at Indiana University's Kelly School of Business. He specializes in cybersecurity and privacy. He joins us from Bloomington, Indiana. Scott Shackelford, welcome to On Point. Hi, Becca. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. So so about this right to be forgotten, I think that this is the one that um, Alex Hearn was, was rightly saying could be the most legally challenging in the United States. Because as far as I understand it, uh, it does with the power uh, of requesting the deletion of information off the internet in the hands of consumers, but doesn't that sort of run headlong into you know, your First Amendment laws here in the United States? No, that's right. And as Alex said, it's not even absolute in the EU. So this has to be balanced against free expression there. But as you guys are talking about, the balancing act and how that would play out in the U.S. is going to be pretty different. Uh, the U.S. and the European Union for some time now have actually been diverging in how we think of privacy rights. What counts as news? What are the privacy rights even of public figures, right? And that divergence is really coming into play when we think about how these EU concepts like GDPR and the right to be forgotten are going to be applied in U.S. courtrooms because, as I'm sure is going to be no surprise uh, to your listeners, we have a really robust tradition of free speech and free expression here, which could run pretty headlong against this idea. Yeah, do you think that the thresholds uh, that Alex Hearn was describing for the right to be forgotten are... Uh, again, this is European Union specific. It hasn't happened in the United States, but are, are the thresholds, you know, you know, high enough, or should they, could they be even higher? Like, should there be a, a period of time where due process can be uh, applied before the information is removed or deleted? Because I, I, it's not clear to me if there's, if there's a significant amount of time in the EU regulations as they stand. That's right. Uh, we should keep in mind that all that's out so far, except for some recitals, is this 88-page regulation. So if anybody's looking for some solid summer beach reading, look no further. Uh, but a lot of the rules remain to be written beyond that, right? So including how we're going to balance, for example, these due process considerations against uh, the right to be forgotten. So right now, it just says under Article 17, you've got to do this without undue delay. Uh, there's some time frames of the mention, like a month, but it's unclear, for example, how much further you have to go uh, to ensure that this data is taken down. There's some language in there about reasonable steps to inform these kind of quote-unquote controllers about this data, and they have to take uh, impact, they have to take active steps to get that data down unless uh, it would require a disproportionate effort. So again, the proof is in the pudding how you define things like disproportionate effort. I'm Megna Chakrabarty. This is On Point. Let's get a quick call in here. Nick is calling from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. You're on the air, Nick. Hi, Nick. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm very encouraged by this uh, EU bill, and um, I'm really excited about the implications for it. The, the main thing I'm interested in is 
the race to be forgotten which seems like a very important thing and if we were to ever create like a digital bill of rights I feel like that would definitely be one of those rights so I guess my questions are um, how exactly is that right to be forgotten going to work in, in the EU? You know, for instance, you're talking about the, the school kid who ran naked in the hallway. You know, uh, at, at, at this time with Super Cookies and the way these companies work and everything, I, I really feel like they're trying to make their online presence more of like a, a resume or a, or a credit report. Mm -hmm. that, that really isn't what this is all about. And I'm wondering if that's part of what this is uh, aiming at. Regulation. Nick, thank you so much for your call. Alex, let me turn back to you uh, briefly on that. And I've got a couple of the follow-ups along Nick, Nick's question as well. Like, does the right to be forgotten apply to third-party third party, pe third party uh, companies who might have access to that same information that people want to want deleted as well? Well, so, so firstly, on, on how they're going to be uh, enforced in general, I mean, they, they didn't entirely hypothetical. Like I say, it's already a right which applies in the EU. If you want to, to ironically Google uh, EU privacy removal, you will end up on Google's right to be forgotten form, which asks you for information including your country of origin, whether you're acting on the behalf of yourself, a family member, a friend, uh, and then you you know you have to give the URL you want to remove, the names that it shouldn't show up for search, and then Google passes it through to a panel of lawyers who assess it and decide whether or not to remove it. This isn't hypothetical, it, it, it's already happening. Um, whether or not you know, issues like how you remove it from a third party are more difficult. It's, it's something which all of these rights are, uh, are running headlong into. There is, there is a data ecosystem. Information gets passed beyond it. The information gets collected by one company and passed on and on and on and on. So, and yeah, there's not yet a clear uh, level of responsibility in terms of how far down that chain the initial data collector has to go. Most obviously, that's what Facebook has, has fallen prey to recently. It, it controlled information handed it off to third party app developers and now hasn't been able to really tell anyone what happened to it after yeah. that fact. It's Tom Wheeler, I heard you so, want to jump in there. Yeah, thanks. thanks Rick. So, you know, Scott made a really good point where he said that these are issues that are yet to be fleshed out and need to be uh, determined in more detail by both regulators and court. And, and this is a process that we go through with everything. You know, we have a robust uh, free speech right in this country, but it's agreed that that does not include the right to yell fire in a crowded theater. So how do we fill in the open spaces? And that's something that will be a matter of public debate in a regulatory process and the judicial process for years to come. And, and so we need to be careful that that we don't talk about this in terms of taking the GDPR and cutting it, pasting it into U.S. Right. law. First, we've got to say, we're going to step up to this issue. And it's fascinating that, you know, the Republicans who were pushing Mark Zuckerberg in both the House and Senate are the same Republicans that voted to repeal the privacy rules that we put in place at the FCC. So let's step up to it and then let's deal with these kinds of nuances as we implement it. Implement it. But we have failed that first test to step up and at least the EU has stepped up to begin the discussion of how do you color in the spaces. Right. Alex Harm, we've just got a, a minute here before the break. Uh, so I, I'm curious, is there discussion in the EU, I mean, given the global nature of digital information, is there discussion in the EU about just how much these new laws could actually have impacts in other jurisdictions? I mean, obviously we're focusing on the United States, but uh, uh, Asia, Africa, etc. There is quite a lot of discussion. I think the two, two thrusts I've had recently are, one, I hope that it will prompt sort of leveling up that other data regulators will see the EU laws, see that they've not destroyed the internet sector in Europe, that Facebook hasn't pulled out, and, and decide that actually, yeah, you know what, we want a piece of that. We're, we're letting our own citizens down. Uh, I've already heard murmurings from Australia and New Zealand in particular that, that this might be a, a thing that they'd like. And obviously, during the Mark Zuckerberg testimony in front of the Senate and the House, a lot of legislators there uh, expressed this yeah. copy the EU. Well, Alex, I'm going to jump in here because we just got to take another quick break. Alex Hearn, tech reporter for The Guardian UK, speaking to us from London. Alex, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And from you, the callers and listeners, after the break, we're talking about the EU's new digital privacy laws set to take in effect 
uh, next month and what it means for digital privacy here in the United States. On the point, I'm Megan Chakrabarty. We're talking about the European Union's new data privacy laws and whether or not we could or want to see similar regulations here in the United States. I'm joined today by Tom Wheeler, former chairman of the FCC from 2013 to 2017, and also by Scott Shackelford, professor of business law at Indiana University's Kelly School of Business. And Scott, I just wanted to ask you a quick question because we are seeing some concern um, about the extent that the EU's laws uh, do go to. I mean, members of the Trump administration, the Secretary of Homeland Security, for example, was starting to express some worry about whether or not these new privacy regulations might actually inhibit I don't know, investigators looking into cyber attacks, for example. I mean, she was quoted as saying, uh, through trying to protect a citizen's privacy, we eliminate the ability of many of uh, vendors, these are cybersecurity vendors and researchers, who otherwise would have access to data see, to see trends in attacks. Is that, is that a, a legitimate concern? It's a good point, um, and that's honestly typically not discussed very much in the GDPR context. Usually the conversation begins and ends with privacy, but there's significant data security and, and breach notification requirements built into that. And as you say, some are good and some are bad. Um, so for example, the GDPR expands the definition of what counts as a data breach and even a broader definition of what's personal data. Um, so in the U.S., for example, not all private data is created equal, right? It matters if it's financial data or health data. We build in protections around that sort of stuff. Uh, in the EU, this is even going to cover your IP address, right? So there's good stuff there. You're going to get faster notifications. It even requires companies to do post-mortems after data breaches to figure out what went wrong and how can they do a better job in the future to make sure it doesn't happen again. Kind of similar to how the NTSB investigates uh, air accidents, right? That yeah. We've seen recently. But there's also some standards in there that we can, uh, that are a bit lower than what we have in the U.S., uh, surprisingly, I think. So, for example, it narrows the scope of who gets notified. Uh, there's no expectation of credit monitoring, no walls of shame like we have in the U.S. as huh. well. And also, it's important to note that GDPR doesn't really apply to national security and to law enforcement investigations, right? So I'm not exactly sure uh, where the Trump administration is coming from uh, on that point, but it is important to just kind of put out there, this isn't a panacea, and you should definitely see the benefits, but also some of the drawbacks in it as well. Right. So, I mean, in the White House's view, the White House Cyber uh, Coordinator Rob Joyce tweeted out that he believes that GDPR would, quote, undercut a key tool for identifying malicious domains on the internet. So, I mean, I think we keep hearing over and over in the course of this hour that um, that we'll really see once the EU starts enforcing the, the law exactly how it's going to play out uh, in reality. But I want to get uh, some calls in here before we run out of too much time, of time. Jamal is calling from Detroit. You're on the air, Jamal. Hey, how you doing, I'm doing great. Um, my, my comment is that we're, this is the data age. And so, you know, we're, everything around us generates some type of data, where, you know, whether you are doing something or not, even your inactivity generates data. And so we're gonna have to build the infrastructure for this data age, just like we had codes to better improve uh, uh, building structure, you know, like construction and stuff like that. We're gonna have to really take this on and not choke off growth. But we're definitely going to have to build the infrastructure for this day to age. Jamal, thank you so much for your call. Tom Wheeler, what's your uh, response? Jamal, spot on. And, and the question is, who makes those rules? Um, do the people, through their representatives, make the rules? Or do the powerful, those who profit by the use of your information and mine, make those rules? And I think it's pretty clear cut that uh, we can't continue a situation where um, privacy is an afterthought. It needs to be something that is, that, that it is your privacy, it is my privacy, and I have the right to control it and to say what happens to it. Emily is calling from Sar uh, Saranac Lake, New York. You're on the air, Emily. Thank you, Magna, for taking my call. My question is, since we're talking about content online, does the fact that we're talking about online content, which is immediately, once it's online, turned into data, undermine or change this notion of it being free speech? So tell me a little bit more uh, uh, about what you're saying, Emily. Are you just saying that the, the, the sheer fact that it goes online converts it to, 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 to speech? To yeah. di okay. So speech equals data. Is that what, is that what you're wondering? Or does it? Okay. Does it equal that you have the right to say it online, but once it's online, it's data, 
and do those have the same rights as speech? Uh, okay, great. Scott Shackelford, I'm going to turn to you for, for your take on that. Right, no, it's a great question as well. There's, there's always a search for analogies here when we talk about data. Sometimes it's, it's the gold of the digital age. I've heard you describe it as the asbestos of the digital age as well. Um, and in terms of the, the free speech rights you get from data, though, frankly, lawyers love to say it, but it's true. It depends, right? It depends. Uh, once the data is up there, the Internet is written in ink. Absolutely. It is really tough to take down. Uh, it can be copied. It's tough to go after those copies to make sure it's just gone. So in discussions of data portability, as you talked about with Chairman uh, Wheeler and uh, rights to be forgotten, it's tough. In the U.S., uh, you know, typically once it's up there, once it's free speech, we build in a lot of protections around, around that speech. If anything, we've expanded the types of things that count as constitutionally protected speech over time, which, again, is going to be uh, make it interesting as we debate through, for example, the proposed consent act or otherwise, kind of where we go next and how we respond to GDPR. You know, Scott and Tom, one thing that we haven't discussed, and and, and right now is, is the business implications here, because right now, yes, there is a microscope, a global microscope on this issue of data privacy because of Cambridge Analytica, Facebook, etc. But, you know, the, that data, that information is... <laughs> It is what these companies sell. It's how they make their money. I mean, so after maybe that microscope pulls back a little bit and people relax, which I suppose inevitably they do in a cycle of things, I mean, are we then likely to see companies say, well, maybe this isn't so great because it, are, 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 are these regulations making it harder for them to do the business they do, Scott? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a good point as well. Um, and it's, it's important just to be clear up front here that we've been talking a lot about Facebook and tech companies, but even if you are a U.S. company and you don't have any uh, situation, you don't have an office, you don't have employees in the EU, you can still be covered by GDPR just by dint of having an internet presence, e-commerce, logistics, travel and hospitality, you name it. So it casts a really, really wide net. Um, and absolutely, as a result of that, there's a lot of built-in uh, protections that we got to keep in mind. And for you know tech companies in particular, it, it, it's unclear what's going to be the end result. There was a great piece in the, in the New York Times uh, just yesterday that it could actually be a boom for companies like Facebook and Google because it's going to raise barriers to entry and make it more expensive to comply with these requirements. So maybe that's going to quash some startups who could otherwise get some footing. Tom Wheeler, uh, do you buy that? I mean, to me, that almost... <laughs> I, I, I don't know, I feel like that's maybe a, a little, not that Scott Shackford is spinning, but it's like, it's sort of trying to put a, a shine on something that Facebook probably, <laughs> in its hard parts, does not like. Yeah, right. Well, you know, I was before I was chairman of the FCC, I was uh, a partner in a venture capital firm. So I dealt with companies that had to compete with Facebook uh, and Google. And they already have huge advantages. You know, I mean, Google, con Google controls, what, 80% of all uh, search ads. Facebook controls over 60% of all logins. I mean, they already have huge reach, which delivers huge amounts of data, which creates huge barriers to entry. What's interesting about GDPR, we talked about it previously, is this idea of the portability of my data. Because if, if I am empowered to take my data from Facebook to a new startup because I like what they do better and I like their privacy better, then I've got a role as a consumer in in helping to identify what those new companies will look like and not have them squashed by the giants. Right, and that's the heart of it, right? Reorienting the notion of who really has control and ownership of this data. Absolutely fascinating. Tom Wheeler, former chairman of the FCC from 2013 to 2017 under President Obama. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Megan. And Scott Shackelford, professor of business law at Indiana University's Kelly School of Business. Real pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. Pleasure's all mine. Thank you. In a moment, what Peter Thiel's data mining company, we're going to talk about that a little bit more, knows about you. It's a lot more than you think. This is On Point. Well, have you heard of Palantir? It's the company PayPal co-founder Peter Thiel, Peter Thiel has. It's a data mining company, and it was originally designed for counterterrorism efforts. But a new investigation by Bloomberg News shows that the company is using war on terror tools to track private U.S. citizens. Joining me now from San Francisco is Peter Waldman. He's one of the Bloomberg reporters uh, who uh, authored this investigation. We've got a link to the story at onpointradio.org. Peter, welcome to On Point. 
Thanks, Magna. So first of all, just quickly tell us, for those of us, those folks who don't know, what exactly is Palantir? So Palantir is a Silicon Valley company. It started in 2004 after the um, attacks of 2001. And it basically exists uh, to help the Pentagon, and the CIA, and others track down terrorists, um, amass uh, and synthesize and analyze intelligence on the battlefields overseas. And later that decade, uh, around 2008, 9, and 10, it got brought back to America. Because Palantir, like every Silicon Valley company, found ways to leverage uh, its data um, analysis to the private sector. So here we have it uh, marketed to banks, to large institutions, corporations of all kinds, and to local law enforcement in the United States. I see you see you, you have uh, police and sheriff's departments in New York, New Orleans, Chicago, and Los Angeles all having used it. Among others, um, what happens is uh, the Department of Homeland Security has quite a bit of money to help law enforcement at all levels synthesize and sort of fuse their intelligence gathering capabilities. This was in the aftermath of the terror attacks on 9-11 when they decided, well, hey, we could have actually detected these people when they came into the country with this plan. Uh, and if we had shared intelligence better among different levels of uh, our uh, law enforcement, we would have figured that one out. So there's a lot of federal money that is helping local law enforcement, and Palantir was an early beneficiary of that. Uh, again, back to around 2009, it started to help set up these fusion centers where its software platform uh, is widely used to integrate and synthesize intelligence. Basically, what Palantir does, I think mean, it's important to understand, it doesn't spy itself, nor do its, uh, its software engineers. What they do, they come in and set up the software platform for the agencies, and then they have access to all of the databases that the agency has. So if it's law enforcement, it's criminal records, driving records, all the kinds of things the state collects, but then it goes well beyond that, too, to scraping the web for social media and oh, things like uh, camera surveillance in parking lots and hospitals and universities. And of course, with uh, facial recognition, that gets you a long way in figuring out who's doing what. It's quite a tool when it, it spits out this sort of image or, or what we call spirogram of links, a link analysis that exists on a screen that any law enforcement person with access can see or any corporate executive or security person who's looking at it and suddenly see these connections that sprawl all over the target's life. Right. I mean, you, you say that like the, the connections include, you know, showing who they're connected through who, as colleagues, who they live with, brothers and sisters, even lovers, what kind of vehicles they own. Now, it's, uh, so it's a lot of information about just average Americans. I presume, though, regarding law enforcement, local law enforcement departments that are using it, you know, as you mentioned, because of these fusion centers, there's still a counterterrorism argument for the use of this information. But I'm also interested in the fact that you said in the private sector, banks like J.P. Morgan are using what Palantir has to offer. I mean, they're, they're buying this information for what? So we have an extended vignette in our article about J.P. Morgan because they were one of the first uh, corporate users in the United States. And really, uh, it's where we see Palantir coming from the war on terror to the weaponization of data against Americans at home. Uh, basically, at J.P. Morgan, what happened was um, the people in the security department, in particular, uh, uh, one of the top forensic investigators there, whose job was to really track and watch employees for potential abuse of corporate assets. They had a huge trading loss uh, in London, the London Whale incident um, back in, in to, uh, before 2009, and they set up this system essentially to monitor employees. What it did was it tracked everything. If they had a, a, a company-issued cell phone, the GPS would tell them where that employee was at any given time. They could uh, synthesize and read transcriptions of uh, the digitally recorded phone conversations in and out of J.P. Morgan premises. They could watch and see when you batched in and when you batched out, and they literally set up a system that's warned to them by a Palantir when an employee changed uh, their badge in pattern. So they they said, well, this employee always came in at 8.30, now they're coming in at 11, maybe they're disgruntled, maybe that takes further scrutiny of their communications, then they might check out their emails or even 
attract them uh, physically after hours. So wow. it led to quite a drag net of monitoring and ultimately a spying scandal within the bank and J.P. Morgan essentially dropped using Palantir after 2013. Uh, mind you, the scandal was, was uh, interesting. It, it actually, the top executives fell under the dragnet and this individual, uh, this former Secret Service agent who ran the forensic investigations, uh, was actually spying on the top executives and looking at their communications and sharing them with an outside executive and uh, that would brought it down. It doesn't seem like the top executives were all that concerned with everyone else. Huh. When it turned on them, they sort of turned off the switch. Ah, uh, as these things happen. Okay, so I mean, you also noted in your, in your investigation that uh, Lord of the Rings fans will recognize the name Palantir. It is a reference to uh, one of those sort of all omniscient crystal balls that wizards use uh, in Palantir. But we just got 30 seconds here left to go, Peter. I, I'm curious, you, you said that Palantir is now marketing this data, this, this, this information, uh, heavily in the private sector. I mean, again, we just got 20 seconds here. What do you think the implications are of this? Well, you don't want it to fall into the hands of employers who use it carelessly or, or unmindfully, such that they're actually watching you, watching uh, your buying, your spending, your family time, your vacation, which is entirely possible. I mean, Palantir is very resourceful as a tool. Remember, it is a tool, so it's really how they use it. And, and you want to be careful about right. who you work for and how, what tools they're using. And who can afford to buy it. Peter Waldman, investigative reporter at Bloomberg, thank you so very much. My pleasure, Megan. Up next on Point, Lawrence Wright on God Save. Despite criticism for sharing disinformation and sharing people's data, Facebook reported another quarter of record earnings. <laughs> It's not enough to just connect people. We have to make sure that those connections are positive. So surveillance is the basis of how Facebook makes money. And that's a good thing. Because it sounds like super cocooning to me. There are you know, a number of very strong protections. The United States doesn't seem to be in the mood to protect its citizens. To a new surveillance reality that surrounds us, that these companies are in charge of, and... It's not enough to just give people a voice. We need to make sure that people aren't using it to harm other people or to spread misinformation. Fake users posting stories on Facebook, videos on YouTube, links on Twitter, can be used by foreign and domestic enemies to undermine our society. So to do, to give us, those of us in the United States, the same sort of protection okay. that European citizens will have is asking too much. We, we've, we spent a lot of time in the last couple of weeks focusing on Facebook, but Facebook is one website, right? Or yeah. several websites. The, the networks that take you there, AT&T or Comcast or, or whomever, they see all the websites you go to. Jeff Chester is the executive director of the Center for Digital Democracy, which advocates for privacy rights. I think for the average person, there's nothing that one can do to protect their privacy. You know, uh, people who study social media, people who do data science, privacy advocates, even the Federal Trade Commission, we've all known about this practice that Facebook has had. And it basically exists uh, to help the Pentagon, and the CIA and others. That is a tremendous amount of power. It's cultural power, it's intellectual power, it's political power, it's financial power. And we have known that. And when, when Zuckerberg said, you know, privacy is obsolete, what he meant was... Uh, Congressman, in, in general, we collect data from people who are not signed up to Facebook for security purposes. In the sense that they have shadow profiles. Which is that, um, you know, as Ben mentioned earlier, the entire business model of Facebook is surveillance. Track down terrorists, um, amass uh, and synthesize and analyze intelligence on the battlefield. I think Facebook, in a sense, is inescapable because the problem is that even if you're on Facebook, Facebook may be on you. But security officials are saying they need to monitor potential terrorists. They see everything you're doing. So we put in place rules. It's now operating at such a scale that ordinary people can't think through the ramifications of what could go wrong. And I'm really sorry that this happened. The fact that it, it was, that that surveillance funds capitalism is what has made us as a people think it wasn't that big of a deal because that surveillance is just going to be used to try to make money. You know, those are reasons to get off of Facebook, but don't get off of Facebook because you think it's going to make a difference. Analysts did not appear to be concerned about U.S. regulators, the Federal Trade Commission, 
harming Facebook's bottom line. But it seems like every few weeks there's a new Facebook controversy that's popping off, so I think that each new controversy gives us a different sense of what the bigger picture will end up being, but we're still in the process of understanding it. Is it a problem they can solve, or is it a problem fundamental to their business model of selling people's to large institutions, corporations of all kinds, and to local law enforcement in the United States? I see you see you, you have uh, police and sheriff's department. It's the rules for those business models as to how privacy is protected. I think Facebook has done wonderful things. It's brought a lot of people together. It's helped, helped to spread democracy. And their conceit was that we're going to use big data to map the personality of every profile. And through this kind of personality assessment, be able to predict their behavior. And really, uh, it's where we see talent here coming from the war on terror to the weaponization of data against Americans at home. And be able to message that, message of them, like figure out who's neurotic and fearful, who's open-minded, who loves the occult, and, and we'll be able to kind of reshape American culture. So some of this stuff is hard to put back in the bag. But there is no will in Congress to force Facebook to create a more skeptical environment. They also, uh, you know, it appears they wanted to sometimes borrow people's identities just to lend a little more credibility to their operation. It started to help set up these fusion centers where its software platform uh, is widely used to integrate and synthesize intelligence. You have to do it by design. I think Congress would tolerate an environment in which fewer things went viral. What they do, they come in and set up the software platform for the agency and then they have access to all of the databases that the agency has. So and when they went viral, they spread less quickly and less far. And there was a reason for getting their friends' data, because the actual predictions were shown in the interface. It, it spits out this sort of image, or, or what we call spirogram. Across the board, we have a responsibility to not just build tools, but to make sure that they're used for good. So, you know, perhaps out of this some kind of good will come, uh, and we can get a little bit of a better handle on the on the boundaries. But of course, one of the problems with the boundaries uh, and the data. Now, Russian trolls uh, spreading uh, propaganda. Everybody's worried about everything. You know, the challenge that Facebook faces is because they're operating on a scale that no one has ever even really thought about before. It was an unprecedented scale when we talked in 2012. But it was at least a scale that was similar in size to nation states. Now that this was an early iteration, they had it quite nailed it. And in its huge scale, they really have no idea what's going on inside the platform around the world. You know, I think they were genuinely surprised to discover that the terror going on. What happens is the Department of Homeland Security has quite a bit of money to help law enforcement at all levels synthesize and sort of fuse their intelligence gathering capabilities. And they said that they wanted to be a platform where a healthy dialogue could take place. They're like every Silicon Valley company found ways to leverage uh, its data um, analysis to the private sector. So Facebook is taking more measures to distance itself. But then it goes well beyond that too, to scraping the web for social media and oh things like uh, camera surveillance in parking lots and hospitals and universities. And of course with uh, facial recognition that gets you a long way in figuring out who's doing what. The Facebook does sometimes take down uh, content or block users, for example, um, you know, in cases of extreme violent content or nudity or when uh, there's somebody encouraging people to harm themselves. That, I think, is going to be the net result of this. How do you do that? You tone down the parts of the algorithm, but it's clear now to adopt and prevent these tools from being used for harm as well. The notion that social media companies are filtering out conservative voices is a hoax. You uh, don't have any proofs in the news, in the piece of news, 99% uh, that it's fake news. And that's where I think regulation comes in. Regulation is the stick. Filtering works on private social media platforms. Social media filtering practices and their effect on free speech. If we just slow things down and we stop treating all conversation as being, you know, potentially substitutable. By first saying you have to have privacy by design. And the differing in laws, I mean, that's quite an important part of nas our national cyber security strategy. In parallel, though, um, and as many people as were, were, were by 
buy into this. The link analysis that exists on a screen that any law enforcement person with access can see or any corporate executive or... Yeah, sort of insinuating themselves into these devices who work out ways to make these jurisdictions less of a barrier. Just getting into creating these images fooling people to uh, encouraging good behaviors and being able to uh, you know, deter the bad ones. The speed with which the ice bucket challenge mm -hmm. spread through Facebook was a result of a whole bunch of engineering choices about, oh, people seem to like these videos, we're going to prioritize them. You can dial it up or down, and I think Facebook may end up dialing it down. Facebook is probably better at collecting so much data about everyone. Um, until two weeks ago when they announced they were ending it. But the truth is that we're in a world where every business is racing to collect as much data as possible. As long as I'm running Facebook. Enormous user base. Incredible economies of scale. World-class infrastructure. Advertisers are tripping over themselves to get involved. No one wants to call themselves a competitor. Now make a list of their disadvantages, right? Uh, a handful of privacy nuts are cranky. <laughs> this is why we need to design a short-term measure which is capable of creating uh, some revenue. We have different forms of opt-out. We don't have an opt-out at the highest level. That would be a, a, a paid product. And, and tomorrow, into a common consolidated corporate tax base system. And, and this is a process that we go through with everything. You know, we have a robust uh, free speech right in this country, but it's agreed that that does not include the right to yell fire in a crowded theater. What I did not know, and I think you know, few of us knew, is this ability to concentrate hatred. When you meet somebody at a party who keeps going on and on about the Federal Reserve, that feels really weird. This is our main proposal, uh, which is to incorporate this digital presence in, into our national corporate tax system. I believe deeply in what we're doing. And the question is, does the mob, does the digital mob end up determining what counts as truth? Democracy is all very well, but truth is not a democratic concept.